aggressive lymphomas, I will talk the most time. I will then switch a little bit to mantle cell lymphomas, maybe to show you two slides, and then indolent lymphomas in the end. But with the aggressive lymphomas, personally, that um, made a lot of attention to me when I started my career. And I saw the one study from Rich Fisher. Still, I see him today in meetings. He is, of course, now 30 years older, but he was doing the one study with CHOP and all the other regiments. And I will um, share with you the slides. Um, this is here um, that CHOP was first introduced to be the first curative treatment. And then all investigators around the world thought we can um, intensify the CHOP regimen, we can improve the outcomes. And as you see here on the slides, there was a second generation of CHOP-like regimen and a third generation, and they achieved more complete response rate. But, and that is the interesting thing, always phase two studies, and therefore not, of course, uh, the evidence which we would like to see and when this was done, this curve published in the New England Journal of Medicine is still what I show all my young hematologists today because it clearly shows that CHOP cannot be improved by itself and you cannot intensify the chemotherapy. And still, this is valid today. I have only one exemption I will show you later on, the French regimen RACVBP which appears to be better than CHOP, but for 30 years, this was still the mainstay of the treatment for aggressive lymphomas, the CHOP regimen. So, um, of course, there were many attempts, as I've shown you, with making other CHOP combinations, but if that was not positive, they then tried to intensify the dose of CHOP by giving it every 14 days. Or you may remember the one thing which happened in America, eight cycles, and the European did six cycles. And then there was this one trial from Germany, which is called the r mega Choep, which I also would like to share with you uh, a few minutes. This is um, the study which was repeated in another country. Two studies were done. CHOP 14 against CHOP 21. So I was sitting in the meetings and I was thinking, what is the better regimen? And I was very disappointed, but also very fascinated that the curves absolutely look the same. So that's quite interesting. Even CHOP R14 is not better than CHOP 21. And therefore still today, at least in all countries I know, CHOP 21 is still the standard, of course, nowadays with the addition of rituximab. This is a very interesting study which was conducted in Germany. I did not participate with my clinic because I found this study very critical. And it's, on the other hand, very important for understanding um, the B-cell lymphoma, how we can treat it. This was even to the maximum of CHOP using identical effective drug at highest possible dose and dose intensity. And here is a regimen. It was randomized, CHOP14 with the addition of etoposide. So more or less here on the lower part, the standard against three times stem cell transplantation with highest dose of the cytotoxic agents like cyclophosphamide 4,500 to 6,000, atriamycin 17, etoposide 1,480. And then um, this um, slide was presented and all the German hematologists were really fascinated. They said, oh, it was a p-value of 0 0.05, hardly missed a statistically significant difference. But the message of the slide is the mega chop is below the standard. So it's not as you thought, maybe the mega chop is better, but the mega chop was even inferior. And we all could guess why this is the case because of so much toxicity that this did not help the patient outcome. 
So this was any many attempts. And then I, of course, don't want to show, which everybody knows, the addition of rituximab really made the big change after 20 years by the introduction of Bertro Covier from France, published later in the New England Journal. And it was rituximab added, added to job, and this really made a better overall survival. And that was true for all patients with aggressive B cell lymphoma. So, again, could it be improved? The art job with all these negative studies in my mind. And then um, the French people, the Chela study, did this RACVBP. And in my opinion, this is quite underused and in many countries, even not established in guidelines. And just recently, even if it's an old study, it was added to the German guideline. And I will show you very um, few slides. This was a study from the JLA, and it was RACVVP, which is comprising of four cycles every two weeks, but then with a consolidation of high dose methotrexide, ifosfamide, VP16, and cytarabine, compared to the typical RCHOP21. And it was, of course, um, higher dose intensity of the critical drugs, but it is a sequential consolidation using second line agents like ifosfamide, VP16, and it has a CNS prophylaxis. All these little pieces of treatment improved disease free survival and absolutely also the overall survival. And that is the reason why I use this regimen quite often in my clinic because that is the only study I remember where the ARCHOP regimen was improved, even in terms of the overall survival. Of course, I will not show you now the toxicity, which is, as everybody could um, expect, much higher with the RACVBP. And so you have to outbalance toxicity against efficacy. But I think that this slide with the overall survival speaks for itself that we should use and um, think about using RACVBP in the special circumstances of young and fit patients. So another study which was for decades um, discussed in America, I remember very well in all ASH and ASCO meetings, they talked about those adjusted epoch. And it was a famous Wyndham Wilson who always said, this is the best treatment ever because you give it over 96 hours. And I was as a young doctor fascinated by this ongoing discussion. And I was wondering when will be the randomized trial out there with those adjusted epoch. And I don't show you the slide, but it was a negative study. Those adjusted epoch did not show improved outcome to our job. And um, today, I only use it as an in international guidelines proposed in the mediastinal B cell lymphoma. But I remember this is only based on one single phase two study. It was not a phase three study, probably because this mediastinal B cell lymphoma is a very rare disease. So you cannot um, organize very large randomized trials, but at least we use in Germany dose adjusted epoch with rituximab for mediastinal. Also, I remember seeing all the slides from um, the Roche um, company showing that the new antibody obinutuzumab will be in vitro and preclinically the much better antibody than rituximab. So I was very much influenced by all this um, information upcoming, and I was thinking, yes, obinutuzumab will be the next antibody replacing rituximab. And we remember the Goya trial um, presented, presented also by um, um, a French regime, French investigator showed that, um, no, it was by um, uh, Italian investigator, um, uh, and it was not any difference to the rituximab. So this is the reason why we still use worldwide 
um, the rituximab antibody in aggressive lymphomas. That also was a highlight in my career because I was expecting with all this preclinical information that obinutuzumab will be the better anti-CD20 antibody. And we know that obinutuzumab is better than rituximab in chronic lymphocytic leukemia is also better not to the same extent in indolent lymphomas with a rather small um, added benefit, but in aggressive lymphoma, it was a 100% negative study. Obinutuzumab did not make any better outcome than rituximab. Also, I remember um, in all the last 10, 15 years, ASH meetings, that uh, many study groups around the world tried to add something to the art shop like bortezomib, lenalidomid, ibrutinib, and so many other um, next um, generation agents. And I was personally thinking the one or the other will make a positive signal. So our job will be the past and there will be a new agent added to this. And here um, I show you what all was done from the Canadian, the Enzastaurine maintenance, then the, from Thier Plamont from France, Lena Lidomit maintenance. We in Germany gave the acute lymphoblastic leukemia protocol instead of CHOP. The bortezomib was added. The dose adjusted epoch was replaced. Ubinutuzumab, NSUNS showed in the Phoenix trials, Ibrutinib, and also um, Vitolo showed the lenalidomide are CHOP. But all these attempts were negative. Very disappointingly, um, nothing helped us to have a better regimen in our hands. So that, again, is uh, quite interesting when I look back for the last 15 years that all these attempts failed. So I have it here in the upper part of the slide, all these negative slides, uh, trials. The only thing which is positive or uh, called to be positive is the addition of polatuzumab. But here it's my personal view. It is a negative or a positive trial. We use it in Germany, CHOP R plus polatuzumab, but we are not so convinced because the overall survival was not influenced and up to this trial, I thought that overall survival is the one and only endpoint in aggressive lymphomas. But I learned that the progression-free survival was accepted from the authorities worldwide for the CHOP R plus minus polatuzumab. So CHOP R polatuzumab is given in this patient with a higher IPI. We have the future showing here. Um, just with a few names of the upcoming compounds in this um, B-specific antibodies, Epcoritamab, Mozunotuzumab, Clofitamab, also the anti-CD19 antibody, Tafacitamab, the BITE antibody, Plinatumumab, the BTK inhibitors, um, which have failed with the brutinib, now is tested with Acala brutinib, and of course the CAR T-cell, which will be discussed later on in your meetings. So I won't tell you about these future things and the um, present things. I just showed you which was most fascinating for me in the last um, studies. One thing which also influenced German guidelines and also my personal view is the introduction of the rituximab biosimilar. And this is something very new for hematologists that there is a biosimilar. We all accepted that there are generics like cyclophosphamide and atriamycin and vincristine. We have generics available. This is identically the same like the originator. But with the monoclonal antibody, we could not expect generics, but biosimilars. And so this was a new challenge for the German Society of Hematology to understand if the introduction of biosimilar could help us. And of course, as we would expect, a biosimilar is not better. But on the other side, from the pharmacoeconomically way, it is um, um, beneficial for the healthcare system because we um, can save some money of the cost of an originator. And I would like to share you a few slides which were discussed very intensely in Germany um, a few years ago. 
So we learned about uh, um, biosimilar and that the biosimilar is highly comparable to the reference product, but never can be called to be identical. The interesting thing is what I've learned in this discussion that even the originator rituximab is not identically over the 10 years. There are many charges of rituximab over the 10, 20 years, and they all look a little bit different because it's not a 100% well-defined chemical structure. It is produced by a living cell line, and so it is um, even within the originator not identical over the 20 years. So the biosimilar, of course, were highly discussed in Germany uh, as an opportunity for the healthcare system to save money and to have an impact on the financial sustainability of the healthcare system. So this is um, how the biosimilars were then discussed with the rituximab here. And we had this rituxin, the GP2013, the biosimilar available. And we looked in Germany for the slides and information uh, about the structure, the function, the pharmacodynamic and the efficacy and safety. And we can see here that they are all um, giving you the same picture, that the biosimilar is very, very similar to the originator and therefore can be used instead of the originator. There were, of course, done many trials with the ADCC, the CDC, and the apoptosis of the original compared to the biosimilar. And in all um, endpoints, they showed that with a highly statistically um, um, endpoint, uh, it appears to be very comparable. So this p-values does not mean that there is a difference. But these p-values mean that it's bioequivalent with a highly statistically p-value, um, considering the assumption that it's bioequivalent. They then made only one study, and that is typically for biosimilar, because you should extrapolate if you accept the fact that a biosimilar is very similar to the originator. You do not have to repeat all the studies which were done with rituximab originator. And so they only made one study as it's accepted worldwide by FDA and by EMA that only one study needs to be done. And then from that study, it can be extrapolated for the other indications. So this was in indolent lymphomas with CVP why they selected CVP plus rituximab, because CVP against CVP rituximab showed the biggest difference in favor of rituximab CVP against CVP. So this is the hypothesis that when you exchange the rituximab originator with the rituximab biosimilar, then you would have the highest chance of seeing any difference the cure the rituximab plays a very big role in the combination R plus CVP. And so this is the endpoint, the, over, uh, the overall response rate and the complete response rate. And very clearly, there is no difference. And so um, the German guidelines were then um, added with this one comment that we can use um, the biosimilar and at least in my clinic, I'm using rituximab biosimilar since the last five years with 100%. I don't use any originator. I use obinutuzumab, of course, which is an originator for other um, indications like CLL. And I use the rituximab biosimilar in all circumstances when I would like to use rituximab originator, even in immune thrombocytopenia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, lupus, and other autoimmune disorders in any B-cell lymphoma, which is Waldenstrom, marginal zone, mantle cell. When I would like to use rituximab as a combination, I use rituximab biosimilar in our ongoing situation. <clears throat> Coming back to the aggressive lymphomas, which is also something which influenced me over the last years, is that in Germany, it was discussed that the vitamin D pre-treatment level may be critical for the outcome of rituximab-containing treatment. 
So I don't want to go into detail. This was shown by the German high-grade lymphoma study group by Michael Fronchu, which has shown in the ASH meetings that the vitamin D level is important for having a good mechanism of action of rituximab-containing treatment. That is the reason why in Germany we have uh, for the very first blood routine a vitamin D level, and if it's below the normal range, we will make replacement of vitamin D, which is quite easy, one pill per week with 20,000 units. That is my personal approach. And then all patients have a normal vitamin D level. And I think this is important in the lymphoma. However, there is never a randomized phase three trial prospectively done because you cannot just randomize vitamin D or not vitamin D in addition with rituximab. So this is um, um, also which um, paid my attention to for the last 10 years. And my last statement here is again coming back to the um, one standard question nowadays, which is answered in Germany. The addition of polatuzumab to CHOP by then um, skipping the Winkris team because of the neurotoxicity is being used, even if it's a many discussion ongoing that this trial did not improve overall survival and therefore was a little bit disappointing, but clearly made a better disease control. So switching for a few moments only to the mantle cell lymphoma, and um, I learned in my very early time point of career that this is the most frustrating B-cell lymphoma entity with the poorest outcome. But over the time, I learned that um, the survival really um, was improved by all these attempts over the last three decades. And I would say even if it's double or even three times longer, the survival uh, compared to the time when I started my hematological career. And why is this the case? Also, this fascinated me the most, that the hydrocytarabine was the most relevant um, key study to show that mantle cell lymphoma patients live longer. And even the stem cell transplantation with younger patients followed by rituximab maintenance by showing by the French study group um, is now the um, standard approach for younger patients. And this come from Germany. And also I was involved in that clinical um, um, science and study. Bendamastin, a very old agent, is an excellent drug for mantle cell lymphoma and also helped the patient who are not eligible for stem cell transplantation to have a better survival than compared to the last 10 or 15 years. So benamastin for the elderly patient is also a main treatment approach for a mantle cell lymphoma. And what recently was introduced to the field, and we remember all the presentations by Michael Wang from Houston in Texas, when he was fascinated to show us the efficacy of single agent activity, ibrutinib. And ibrutinib really made a change also in the mantle cell lymphomas. However, we have learned over the last two years that ibrutinib may have some cardiotoxicity and maybe the second type generation uh, BTK inhibitor, sanuprutinib and acalaprutinib are a better choice because of less toxicity, which is true. They have less toxicity. And um, uh, interestingly, acalaprutinib and sanuprutinib are approved by the FDA in US America, not approved in Europe. Ibrutinib is approved in Europe, but ibrutinib was withdrawn in America from the approval for mantle cell lymphoma. So that is at the moment a little bit interesting time in Germany. I would like to give Zanoprutinib, for example, instead of Eprutinib, but it has no approval and indication, but I ask them insurance companies and they will give a positive signal to rather switch to the BTK inhibitor with less toxicity. So the Eprutinib clearly made its place for relapsed and refractory mantle cell lymphoma, where also the bortezomib and linalimid did show activity, 
but it's not used so often. And the ibrutinib, of course, in the just latest shown triangle study, really showed an improved outcome, even with a postulated um, statement that you could skip stem cell transplantation when you add ibrutinib them from the very first day of treatment to the um, um, chemoimmunotherapy followed by stem cell transplantation followed by rituximab. And when you give this all in combination with ibrutinib, then you have an improved outcome. Again, that is then a situation that ibrutinib comes along with a higher toxicity and maybe could be replaced in special cases by the zanoprutinib or acalabrutinib. This is a trial I just um, mentioned, and I just show you um, very few moments. This is our DHEB, um, high-dose cytarabine, including chemo induction, followed by stem cell transplantation, and then randomized for observation or rituximab, and the rituximab maintenance for younger patient after stem cell transplantation shows improved disease control and improved overall survival and therefore is a standard approach in Germany and in most other countries um, that younger patients should be treated with this um, treatment strategy. So mantle cell lymphoma, just um, 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 again uh, showing you my points, uh, the bendamastin rituximab made an impact also in elderly, and I would like also to make a comment because also I have seen as a previous speaker, one from Italy, that the Italian colleagues have shown that adding cytarabine to bendamastin is even further improving the activity of bendamastin. There was not done a randomized trial with this, but in Germany, it's quite a standard in elderly patients who are fit enough, um, then you can maybe increase the efficacy of bendamastin rituximab by adding some cytarabine to this combination. In indolent lymphomas, um, that's quite interesting because I was involved with my study group in Germany in um, showing the efficacy of bendamastin. And what is first I learned when I went to the meetings that there was a debate between the US American colleagues, um, Bruce Chesson, Sandra Horning, and Rich Fisher. And they have made big discussions 20 years ago, go, do you need for a typical indolent lymphoma the antracycline containing treatment chop, or maybe CVP without antracycline is good enough? This really fascinated me and influenced me for my later career because it was five years ongoing debates between these people and there was no clear answer. And also what I learned in these old days that even watch and wait versus Clambusil has its place, which was shown by the British colleague Adeshna. So in the indolent lymphomas, we call these uh, many different entities which can be called follicular, the most common indolent, the marginal zone, which comprise splenic, nodal, and extranodal, and the lymphoplasmocytic, the SLL, counterpart of CLL, the Waldenström's disease with a high IgM. What we learned over the years, even if there were no randomized trial, that the rituximab found its place, and no treatment is given without rituximab in these indolent lymphomas. And the bendamastin is now a mainstay also for all these um, indolent lymphomas. At least I showed in my study where we tested bendamastin rituximab against chop rituximab in follicular marginal zone, Waldenström and SLL, and showed that the bendamastin has a little bit less toxicity. Of course, we all know bendamastin has also its toxicity, but it is very different from the CHOP regimen. And so it's a beneficial treatment for elderly and frail patients in particular. What also I um, was fascinated over the last 20 years is what Chil Sal showed us with a PRIMA trial, the rituximab maintenance. I was invited to so many international debates. Do we need rituximab maintenance after rituximab chemotherapy in follicular lymphoma? And of course, I know that most 
investigators, most doctors around the world give rituximab maintenance. However, in some very large countries, they skip it because they say it's a lot of financial burden when you um, add a two-year rituximab maintenance and it does not improve overall survival. So that was also a very fascinating um, time of my hematological careers when I was part of the discussion and also was sitting in the audience. Is rituximab maintenance um, absolutely necessary because you have a better disease control or it is not highly important because it has no influence still today on the overall survival expectancies of the patients? Coming back to the other anti-CD20 antibody, obinutuzumab showed an improved disease control, but not a better overall survival. And so obinutuzumab clearly was adopted in all guidelines of the world. And um, however, you read still in all guidelines of the world and the same place, rituximab can also be given because obinutuzumab was not so much superior that you should avoid rituximab. So in many countries in the world and still in Germany, most patients are still treated with a rituximab combination in indolent lymphoma. So Valdenstrom, marginal zone, lymphoplasmocytic are clearly treated with rituximab and in most circumstances bendamustin or CHOP. And in follicular lymphoma, we have this gallium study where the obinutuzumab was given. The gallium study also has shown marginal zone lymphoma patients, but the difference was so small that still many German hematologists use rituximab-based treatment in indolent lymphoma. Again, when you use rituximab, we use in Germany the rituximab biosimilar. And also what is interesting in the last 10 years when I followed this very famous study, augment um, study, lenalidomide rituximab um, is um, also a very good uh, regimen, despite the fact that I know lenalidomide from multiple myeloma for the decade before, but now I use the R-square regimen in relapsed uh, indolent lymphomas. And from my point of view, it gives me an excellent treatment um, tool in my hands to give another mechanism of action treatment in my patient failing um, the indolent lymphoma first line treatment. However, one, also one what is a matter of one, all one, one, debates, one if a relapse happens 10 years after the first line treatment, of course you can repeat the first line treatment a second time because after 10 years remission duration, why not just um, repeating the first line treatment and interestingly, in the indolent lymphomas, the new agents like BTK have not found its place, like in CLL, where the BTK and venetoclax BCL2 inhibitors absolutely replaced chemotherapy. But in indolent lymphomas, chemotherapy is still quite often used. So I just show you where the very few slides, what I have seen Prof with the bendamustins. Um, the bendamustin was approved. And so um, coming to my last slide, um, indolent lymphomas, <clears throat> I showed you all my best memories about the last 20 years. Finishing now my presentation and hopefully we could have some questions. I thank you for your attention so far. Thank you very much.